This grammar generates arithmetic expressions with integer values 0 through 9 and separated by plus and, and, and multiply symbols. It's part of the grammar in any language that lets you have expressions on the right side of assignment statements. Normally, instead of these being 0, 1, 2 through 9, these would be something called an identifier. You know, that could be a variable or a number. And a variable is something else that could be something. And an identifier is something else that could be something. And that's how the grammar grows and grows. But this is just one little fragment of it. And I made it simple. We just allow single symbols. And there's a reason, because I want to talk again about ambiguity. And I want to talk again about the semantic interpretation of two different parse trees. Here's where you're going to see a difference. So questions so far about the parse tree that we use to generate this string from this grammar. Let's come up with a different parse tree. So we, instead of starting with s plus s, we're going to start with s times s. And now the left side becomes s plus s. And the right side becomes 5. And this becomes 3. And this becomes 4. There's the parse tree. These are completely different. You cannot lay one on top of the other and have them match up. The nodes don't match. Therefore, this grammar is ambiguous, ambiguous on the string. And it's actually, there's a, almost any string, any string actually, it, you can find, find two different parse trees. This is a completely ambiguous grammar. Why does it matter? It's because the compiler has to use these trees not just to say yes or no, but often in the next stage to get some semantic interpretation or meaning to the thing that it just read. So when the compiler reads it this way, it assumes that your expression is 3 plus 4 giving you 7. 7 times 5 gives you 35. And you could write a nice little simple recursive program that evaluates parse trees like this by recursively going down to a node, doing the operation in the middle on the two children, and then propagating the values back up. And this one gives you 35. What would this one give you? 23. Well, which one is right? What do we normally mean this? Normally we mean this one, because there's an automatic precedence of these values. If you write the grammar this way, there is no precedence implied between the values. And because of that, the semantic interpretation of the parsing gets lost. And that's bad. And that's why ambiguity is bad. How do you fix it? There's a lot of ways to fix it, but um, OK. Um, well, here's one way to add two different symbols and fix it. I'm going to add two more symbols to my alphabet. So now when you generate strings in this alphabet, you have to generate them with parentheses. Does this fix it or not? Let's see. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So now this is no longer a legitimate string in the language. What is a legitimate string in the language? This is this is both of these strings have parse trees. They have unique parse trees, each one. Let's look at it. You no longer can. Right, parse trees will be essentially the same. But, but Let's look at the parse tree for this one, Chris. So this one, what's the first one we're going to do? This one. S, S times S. S times S, because that's the outer one, right? So S times S. But wait, there's more. There's open paren, close paren. Now what about this s? It becomes open paren s plus s close paren. And this becomes and this becomes 3, and this becomes 4. Right? So this is the parse tree for this one. There is no other parse tree for this one. 
There's no other way we can do it. We've gotten the ambiguity out of the grammar by forcing the person who's writing their program to choose either this or this. That's one way to do it. There's other ways. But I just want you to see that you can have many different grammars that generate essentially the same thing, that one is ambiguous, one's not ambiguous. Okay. Questions about this? New example. Example four. Now we'll focus not so much on the definitions and ambiguity and on derivations, but let's focus more on, uh, on how to build these grammars if I give you a problem. If I say, here's a language, build a grammar. It's harder than doing finite state machines. Grammars tend to challenge people more than writing machines challenge people. Machines are a process. Most people can kind of program them and figure out what to do next because it's iterative. But grammars are very elusive in, in trying to pin them down. One style is to use a recursive idea and to define the grammar inductively based on a recursive idea. That's one style. Another style is like you do with machines. Have each non-terminal have a semantic meaning and keep that semantic meaning consistent. So I'll write that st uh, strategy number two. Semantic meaning for the non-terminals. But I've got to add that this is an art, and it's not so easy to just come up with grammars. Let's do two examples. We're going to do equal zeros and ones. That means the zeros don't have to come before the ones. They can be mixed up as long as there's an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones. It's definitely not a regular set. Let's come up and make a context-free grammar for it. This is going to be an example of the semantic meaning style. S is supposed to generate anything that has an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones, and everything that has an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones. So we have to make sure that everything like this can be generated by this grammar, and nothing that's not like this is generated by the grammar. Got to make sure both ends. Sometimes you can include everything you want, but you would inadvertently include things you don't want. Be careful. Sometimes it's good to include things you don't want and then try to chop them off. Sometimes you've got to get it all done at the beginning. So here's how we'll do it. We've got two choices. We either start with a 0 or we start with a 1. If we start with a 0, we'll go to another semantic state called A. And if we start with a 1, we'll go to another state called B. And here's the semantic interpretation of A. Well, you tell me. What should A generate? Describe the strings that A should generate if I started with a 0. Things that have one extra 1 in them, that have one more 1 than 0. Anything that has one more 1 than 0. B should generate strings any string that has one more zero than one. Will it be easy to describe that? Will I eventually loop back and be able to describe this in terms of the non-terminals I have? I hope so, because I don't want to keep making this grammar. I don't want to make an infinite number of non-terminals. That's not a grammar anymore. So hopefully, when you do the semantic approach, you wrap around and you define your non-terminals in terms of ones you've already seen. You'll see this immediately. Uh, need a terminal yeah, I guess what else can S go to? Empty. Empty. Now let's go to A. A has two choices. You start with 0, you start with 1. If you get a 1, what do you continue with? Any string that has an equal number of zeros and 1s. A, I like to think of A as I owe you a 1. Okay, if you want to give it a meaning, O you a 1. B is I owe you a 0. And S is, I don't know you squat. We're even. <laughs> so if A pays you back the 1, that it doesn't owe you a 1 anymore, you're even. What if A starts out with another 0? Then what happens? Then you're two 1's in the hole. Give me one string that has an extra 1, and then another string that's got an extra 1. That'll give me any strings that have two extra ones. What about B now? Let's finish up this whole grammar. 0s and 1bb. This is one way to write a grammar. Think of the semantic meaning of the non-terminals and wrap them around and define them in terms of each other. 